Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me for user testing. Um, you had four other choices, or three other choices, and you chose this one, so I hope that I don't disappoint. My name is Tanya Gibson. Um, I am a web project manager here at the university. I work in web development services um, within the department of uh, the Office of Information, um, Office of Information Technology. Um, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and my email address here. Um, very often, I'm the loudest person in the room. I come from a loud family, blame them. However, today, I have uh, a sick infant at home. When she gets sick, the whole family gets sick. So if I sound like I swallowed a frog, I apologize. Um, just bear with me. Blame her, not me. <laughs> Uh, so what I want to talk to you today about, um, what is user testing, why should you test, who should be doing the testing, um, both from the uh, test user's perspective and from the facilitator's perspective, when should you test during your project, and how much does testing cost. Mm -hmm. Then I am going to talk to you about a case study. I'm going to present an actual project that we worked on here at the university um, and just give you some insights on our experience through the user testing process there. So to begin, what is user testing? So what's the difference? Right? We hear user testing, we hear usability testing, we hear UX testing, we hear user experience testing. All of these terms are kind of thrown around, used interchangeably, sometimes correctly, sometimes not so much. So uh, my colleague, Robert Ivan, Robert, raise your hand. <laughs> he advised me. <laughs> He advised me not to bore you to death by reading verbatim, so I promise I won't do that, except for this slide. Um, usability testing is a technique used in user-centered interaction design to evaluate a product by testing it on users, real live people. Usability testing focuses on measuring a human-made product's capacity to meet its intended purpose. Examples. So products that commonly benefit from usability testing are foods. We've all seen the taste test commercials and ads. Um, consumer products from cosmetics to, um, you know, whatever wide array of consumer products to websites or web applications, which is relevant to, to this audience. Um, computer interfaces, documents, devices, the list goes on and on. Basically, anything that a human is going to use, you want the human to test. Usability testing measures the usability or the ease of use. And that experience can be different for everyone. So it is good practice to test on a variety of people. So why should you test? Um, one of the biggest reasons why you should test is for cost and time savings. It is easier to test or to make changes to a prototype or a drawing or something very simple than it is to make changes once the building is built. So you want to test early and often to make sure that you are meeting your user's needs before you get far into the building of the product. So another reason why you should test, you want to ensure that your user's needs are met. Uh, so this is a pretty popular infographic. Um, and when you approach a product, Everyone on the project team has a different mental idea about what this product should be. So how do you find out what is really needed, what the actual users need? You test, right? So for example, the first iteration, 
You have a swing with three seats that no one can actually sit on except the top one. You come up with a quick prototype, you test that, you realize very quickly this is not the right solution. Second prototype, the swing cannot swing through a tree. So you come up with a quick prototype to realize, okay, this is not right. And so on and so forth, you test different variations until ultimately you find what works and what the user needs. So who should be testing your product? So some thoughts on user testing. Dilbert says, we interviewed hundreds of users and turned all of their suggestions into features of our product. As it turns out, every user we talked to was an idiot and their dumb suggestions ruined our product. In hindsight, we probably should have talked to people who work outside this building. <laughs> so that tells us that you are not your user. If you don't take away anything else from this presentation, I need you to take away this key point. So everybody stay with me. You are not your user. We can do that better. Come on. You are not your user. Very good. Um, you have to test outside your building. So how do you find uh, good people to test? First, you want to identify your target user audience. Um, you may or may not be familiar with an exercise of finding user personas. Um, that's outside of the scope of this discussion, but you want to identify user personas. And then you want to recruit representative users that fall within those groupings or categories. You want to ask them to test, to perform tasks on your product, and you can identify uh, particular tasks. And then when you're testing, another key point is you want to let the user do the talking. You be quiet, you observe, let the user talk through their thought process. That is going to help you discover so much information um, that you just wouldn't be aware of otherwise. So another key uh, statistic, and excuse me for a second. So here is a very important uh, point um, from Nielsen Norman Group. And um, they say that you don't really need to test with a lot of people. You can find 80 to 90% of your issues with a handful of people, um, five to 10 people. Um, and we actually did find that to be the case uh, with the project that we worked on, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So who should facilitate the test sessions? This quote from Steve Krug, uh, the author of Don't Make Me Think, he says, I believe, I believe strongly that everyone can and should be doing their own testing. And what does that mean? So you can hire professional UX researchers that do this Professionally, this is all they do, and they can give you some really solid insights. Um, or you can get your content strategists if you have that resource on your team, or your designers, or basically anyone on the project team can perform tests. Because essentially what you're doing is you're asking questions, you're observing, and you're listening. Anyone can take notes. Anyone can listen. So some tips for the facilitator if this is not your primary profession. Um, you want to watch an experienced usability tester run a sample session with a pilot user. And you can find videos online or if you, you're unfortunate enough to know a UX person Ask them if they, you can sit in on their session just to see what their style is, what their technique is, and get some pointers. During the test, again, you want to keep quiet, let the user do the talking. 
Do not lead or guide the user. Um, and try to avoid answering questions if possible. So for example, you can say things like, well, just do what you would normally do at home or at your office, as if I were not in the room with you. When should you perform your tests within the project life cycle? Now, you want to perform your tests at any stage of your project. Ideally, you want to test before the project gets started. You want to test during your project, early and often. And then you want to test after to make sure that you solve the problem that you set out to solve. Um, one popular methodology is Lean UX. Um, and this is the concept that you want to work in a um, cyclical fashion in that you think about the problem, you make a solution, a prototype of some sort, and then you check, meaning you test. So you want to think, make, check, think, make, check, and you want to do that often throughout the life cycle. <coughs> so how much does all of this cost? It sounds great, I would love to test a million people. How much do I need to budget for my project? Well, if you're richy rich, and you have money bags, and you can throw money at the project. The rest of this talk is really irrelevant, so you can feel free to go on vacay now. <laughs> you can hire um, consultants, you can hire you know, big firms to handle all of this for you. But the reality of the situation is that most project budgets kind of look like this. Um, very often user testing is not a priority of your client um, and it very often gets squeezed out. But it's, it is such an important part of every project just to make sure that you're not, like I mentioned before, you're not losing money, you're not losing time, and you're not wasting effort. Um, you have a, a wide range of options. So the more expensive side, you like I said, you can consult external vendors. Um, you can go to you know very sophisticated usability labs and um, have all of this kind of coordinated for you. Um, another kind of mid-range tool that we've used in the past is usertesting.com, where you can um, it's a web-based product where you can. Um, put your prototypes online and have people um, who fit your user um, persona categories, they can test for you and they'll record their thought process and you can kind of see how they're working through your prototype. And then a quick and dirty way, find your friends, family, Again, anybody that you have quick and easy access to, you want to just ask them some questions just to make sure that you're on the right track and you want to be able to pivot quickly if you need to. So going into the case study, um, about a year ago we worked on the website for the Office of the Dean of the Faculty. And I will talk to you about the overall project goals, describe our usability test approach. I will show you the prototype that we actually use and some examples of the test um, setup that we did. Um, talk about some of the findings and the actions taken and then some of the results. So this was our starting point. Um, as you can see, the design was extremely outdated. The content was very poorly organized. Um, and users just got really frustrated trying to find their way around the website. So frustrated, in fact, that at some point they set up this quick links feature which basically means users can't find what they're looking for, so let's plop it in here so they can find what they're looking for. <laughs> so 
So um, I mentioned before a good practice is to test before. So we did some quick and dirty tests on the current design just to kind of get an idea of what the current problems are. Where are users struggling? What are they looking for? Where are they um, running into roadblocks? So we found, uh, again, the users found it difficult to find the information that they're looking for. Um, this site was very, very content heavy. Um, the content was not organized in an intuitive manner, so following the user's thought process, they could not think through how to find the content that they were looking for in an easy way. Um, the navigation was confusing and information was buried deep into the site, so often six, seven clicks deep. That's way too much. So for the purpose of this presentation, um, we're gonna just focus on our testing for the navigation. Um, and what we found to begin with, so essentially there were four different navigation ways to access content. If you land on the home page, where do you even begin? So users are spending way too much time reading through content. You can't just easily scan to find where you should begin. We realized that the main navigation and ultimately the information architecture of the website um, was designed based on user role as opposed to the user action that the, the user is trying to take. Users did not know what group they belonged to, therefore they found it confusing to know where to be, even begin. So for example, a faculty could also be a professional. So if I'm looking for a document that is relevant to both user roles, where do I begin? Right, so if I choose faculty, then I'm clicking all around, I can't find what I'm looking for, and you know, you just go down the rabbit hole of confusion. So running test, se test sessions. This is essentially the approach that we um, took to testing uh, some of our assumptions. Um, again, we first identified the target audience groups. We found volunteers from sample, a sample set. We developed the scope of the first test session. So we narrowed down specifically what we wanted to test as opposed to testing you know, several features or the entire product. We created a working prototype with clickable links. We identified key user tasks that we wanted to test, um, have the user walk through and test. We created test scenarios. Um, and then we performed the test. We asked and observed the user as they were uh, stepping through the tasks that we created. We asked testers to talk through the actions and their thought process. And then we gathered, analyzed the results, and we took action based on our findings. So for this case study, our target, audi our target audience, we broke into two groups. So we had our primary group, and then we had our secondary group. So for the purpose of this test, we just chose a handful of people um, from our list of primary users. And in fact, um, I think the final number was 19 people. So how do we go about finding test volunteers? The easiest way is just to ask people, ask who you know, um, you know, ask the department managers, and we found, you know, most people are more than willing to help. Um, other ways that you can find users, send out an email blast to a rele relevant email distribution list, and you'll very often get people who are willing to help. Um, you can set up a recruitment table in a highly trafficked area. Um, you will very quickly find people who are willing to help. Um, and in some cases, if your budget allows, you can offer a small incentive um, that also kind of encourages people to sign up and help you test. So again, the scope of the first test, uh, test session. 
So we went through um, our information architecture exercise to come up with a new information architecture structure and we landed on this prototype for our um, for our main menu to test. Um, this is an example of um, the test scenarios and I actually have a better picture that I can show you after this um, where we listed the test questions that we were asking the users to walk through. Um, and then this was a space where we just left to write our observations down. Um, so the test lab. What should your test lab look like? If you don't have a big budget to have a fancy testing lab, what can you do? Very simple. Set up some laptops, have people come to a room. All you need is a computer and internet connection. This is not our exact testing lab, but it was very similar to this. We essentially um, just reserved a room, we set up workstations, um, and we asked users to um, kind of sit at the workstation. So you want your test lab to be simple. Um, you want to include a seat for the tester and for the facilitator. Um, what we did, we also offered a choice of operating system. So some people are very familiar and comfortable with Windows. Um, others are more comfortable with Mac. Um, so it helps that a user tests on the uh, environment that they're comfortable with to help um, alleviate any distractions. Um, and again, you want to minimize distractions around the room and chatter. Yes? Is it important to make sure that uh, Windows and Mac is being used? And what about browsers? Uh, do, you, do you want to make sure that your sample population is, is getting a, a cross-section of those? That's a great question. So yes, you want to offer um, option of browsers. Um, when you're doing your unit testing, you absolutely want to test across browsers. When you're doing user testing, that's not always important so much in the beginning. And then it also depends on how you are performing the tests. So if it's a web-based application, um, then you want to be conscious of that. But if you're using um, you know, something that's right on the desktop, then that may not, the browser may not um, necessarily be a factor. When your tester arrives, um, there's not too much information that you want to give them because um, you don't want to lead them on, but you want to do kind of give them a little bit of an introduction why they're there. You want to welcome the user. You want to ask the user to sign in. So what we did is we asked them to self-identify based on our list of uh, predefined um, user roles. So for example, if we thought someone um, fell in the category of a department manager, and they said, well, no, I'm actually not a department manager. I see myself as another role. You want to make sure that they are self-defining. And then um, if you can talk to them and kind of discuss, like, you know, well, why do you not consider yourself a department manager and kind of see where they see themselves. Um, again, allow the user to choose their OS or web browser preference. Um, encourage user to think out loud. Um, there's so much that you can find from them just thinking through their thought process. And then you want to just inform use the user of the purpose of the test. So every user that came in, we just um, started the test session by letting them know the purpose of the test are to help us determine how our content should be organized so we can make the website easier to use. Um, it was very important for us to let the user know that you are testing us, we're not testing you. So you want to take some of that anxiety off of the user um, and just put a frame of reference for why they're there. So how our prototype. We use a tool called Envision. Um, our uh, designer, Joanne Tunney, she created all the mock-ups that you'll see. Um, and using Envision, you can create mock-ups, which are just graphics, PDFs, JPEGs, whatever. Um, and you can link them 
to simulate actually using a website. So I will show you how we went about doing that. So this is an example of the library of assets that Joanne created. And you can see for each template, she created um, a wireframe. Um, and they're kind of, they're mid-fidelity. She gets into her high-fidelity mock-ups a little later um, here. But essentially, this was our starting point. So, you know, we had this up on the screen. When the user came to the test, um, we had set them in front of the computer, and then we asked them a series of questions. So, for example, if you wanted to find someone who works in the department, where would you go? And you watch them, you observe them. Again, you encourage them to talk through their process. So if I said, hmm, well, working at Princeton, working at Princeton seems like I could find somebody who works there, but maybe about seems more relevant. So if I click on about, oh, okay. So the office directory here, okay, I found what I'm looking for. So then, you know, we observed what they were talking. We observed how many clicks it took to find what they were looking for. Um, and then we observed any obstacles they may have faced. So for example, the word working at Princeton caused a little bit of confusion. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we captured to make sure that we go back to reevaluate. Um, and then, you know, the tool uh, just allows you to link each menu item to various screenshots, um, and it's, it's very quick to make changes. So while I'm here, I want to show you... This is the document where we identified all of our user roles. And then here is an example of some of the questions that we asked. So for example, if the person said that they identify as a pro um, department manager, we would ask the department manager a set of questions. Find the rules and procedures document for the faculty researchers and specialists. So that's something we learned really on that was really important for department managers. So that was one of our first questions. Where would you find the calendar of deadlines? Find the chair's guidebook, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. So we identified important tasks based on the user role. And you can see that we did that for every single role. So we have um, the department chair persona, we have the faculty assistant persona, and so on. When redesigning was uh, mobile responsiveness for instance? Or yes, yes. So that's a great them? question. We did not contact uh, conduct specific user tests on like a laptop or a phone um, just because, to my point, we didn't have the budget for it. So we had to do something quick and dirty just to get <laughs> some kind of results. But within our team, we did test the final design across all browsers and devices. So you tested, now what? 
So I think one of the things that um, <coughs> we were not prepared for was the volume of data that we gathered. Um, and I think um, one of our biggest lessons learned is that it is very important to stay organized um, and collect your data in an organized manner. So we went, when we went back into our review sessions, we started to, oh, somebody mentioned that, but I don't quite remember who, and I think two people said this, but, and we started to kind of confuse ourselves. So um, a key tip is to make sure that you are extremely organized in collecting your data. Um, we took the data, we went back, and then we kind of categorized it based on um, several factors, right? So um, if we were looking for tasks around um, finding forms or uh, documents, we would categorize the results for any problems or even things that were right about finding forms or documents. Then we worked um, along with the client to prioritize. Right, so we found all of these issues, we found all of these problems. We can't necessarily make changes to every single thing. So you tell us, let's talk through what's important. What should we address? What should we leave alone? Um, there was you know, one case where, for example, um, one person may have identified something that was a problem to them, but <coughs> nine other people didn't even mention it. You know, is that something that you should even address or consider, or do you just leave that alone? Um, it just so happened that this one issue was something that was important to the client, right? I want to surface this information to the users. My users today may not know about it because we don't have it on our current web website, but I want to make sure that they are aware of it on the new website. So the client did prioritize that as an, a high item to resolve, um, even though the users didn't. And overall, may, may we ask you like, to share maybe a bit more information on the interaction with the client itself? Like, what was the, the, cli the climate and the atmosphere from the start of the project, then at the moment of the user testing and, uh, you know, closer to the end? Like, did the client come up with everything like, okay, I want the site like this, 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 and that, and like, oh, why do we even want to do the user testing? What, what was the story with the client? Uh, if you don't mind sharing more details on that, that would be interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so um, it, let me know if I'm, I'm answering your question. Um, so um, we worked along with the client in working sessions. So we met with the client every week. Mm -hmm. um, and we chose a certain feature or section. So for example, um, we did a series of sessions to talk about the IA. Um, we did a series of sessions to identify and define our content types. Uh, we did a series of uh, review sessions to um, define what the layout and the views should be to match our content types. And then our designer went about creating the wireframes. So that's kind of a high level of our process to get to the wireframe point. Mm -hmm. um, we were very fortunate with this particular client that they saw the importance of user testing. So they were very encouraging. They worked well with us to help us find sample testers. Um, they actually did that work for us. So they gathered the testers, they came up with a list of people who were willing to volunteer. Um, but what we did is we set up the testing environment. Um, and then you also find that you have a range of testers. Some are technically savvy, some not so much. Right? So your technical savvy people, their test session may have been five minutes. They clicked around real quickly, they talked real fast, and they got to what they were looking for really quickly. But then you had some people who were not as technically savvy and they talked real slow, they asked a lot of questions, and that's where we kind of had to very often, well, what would you do? How would you think this through? What, you know, how would you, what would you do if I were not here? 
Um, from generally, that does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that that does for for the first part. Okay. For the second part, when you presented that actually to the client, how acceptive were they of that feedback, or were they like accepting it partially, or saying, "Oh no, we're not going to be doing that at all," despite the fact like everybody's pointing to that? Sure. Were there? How how did that go? That's a good point. It varied. Right, so again, just like we did working sessions with the client to arrive at the testing session, we did post-testing reviews with the client. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and we, you know, walked through all of the, the um, results. Um, and like I said, the, this particular client was really supportive, so they actually sat in on some of the tests. Mm -hmm. And that was so invaluable because they saw for themselves you know some of the issues that we're using that w that the users were facing and i think that was so more powerful than us just telling them you know the users struggled with this but they actually saw the user struggle with this so i think that was you know if you can ever if you have the opportunity to have your clients sit on the test sessions um, that is very very invaluable um, another example, we're working on another, another project now where our tester, um, our clients are doing their own user testing, right? So they've heard from, you know, other departments within the university, they know how powerful um, user testing is, and they actually took it upon themselves. With our guidance, they made up their user questions, um, they're running their own test sessions, and they came back to us like, wow, oh my goodness, we thought X and our users showed us that it was Y. So it is really, really um, a powerful tool. Did I answer? Okay, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so um, after we prioritized everything, um, the items that were prioritized high we made quick changes to the prototype and quick in like a day or two. So that is the key to this in that we can make changes really quickly. Um, by the end of the week, we were retesting our assumptions. Same prototype, same mock-ups, but just you know slight changes. So it, our changes were so quick or so much quicker than we would have been able to if we had to make the changes directly to the website, to the web build. And again, one of our key findings, we tested 19 people, we realized that was way too much. We did it over a course of a week, there were te each day we tested five people, and so what we were starting to see was that people were saying the same things. If they couldn't find the department uh, list, they couldn't find it. If one, per one person couldn't find it, it's very likely that the rest of the testers can't find it either. So you really don't need a lot of people to find the key important issues with your prototype or design. If you have uh, different kinds of users, like you know, you have your professors, you have students, or you have other users, um, what would you recommend for them to Ideally, you want to test across the range, right? So if you've identified that those are your target audience, so if you have a student, if you have a professor, if you have a department manager, you want to test at least one department manager, at least one professor, at least one student. That's ideal. So you want to get the people from their perspective. Um, so it wouldn't you, be five from you. Correct, okay. correct, correct. Okay. Um, so finally, we were able to very quickly, like I said, make a new prototype. Um, so the first one, uh, the other thing that we realized, the menu titles were too long. So people struggle to scan quickly to get to what it is that they're looking for. Um, so one of the changes that we made, including rewording, was to shorten the titles so that they can scan very quickly. We changed it quickly, we changed it on the prototype, we retested, 
and finally, that's what we where we landed, um, and we implemented the website. We went into our build and launch. Yes. Did you retest it? Did you retest with all of nineteen? Or okay. no. we just kind of where you made the decision like we don't need everybody back. Correct. Correct. We don't need to retest for all nineteen. Let's just grab five or six of the test subjects. I think some people were even brand new. Um, and we retested. Uh, so the, not not all of them were the new users. Some were rep repetitive uh, testers the second time. What do you think? Who would be the best tester in this case? A repetitive tester coming back in again for a second session, or or a new one? Both. 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 You, we needed the perspective of both. Um, so um, from the non-technical person from the first set of testers, that person was good to retest on um, because the technical person, they kind of navigated their way around either way, but it was a non-technical person where we can really see our change made a huge difference for them. Um, and then we kind of validated that with the new tester, right? So they're coming in with fresh eyes. Did they struggle with the same issues that the first test group did or? Were they able to, you know, easily make their way through? And most people in the new, um, the new group, they were easily able to make their way around. When you were performing tests, um, the test lab showed multiple workstations, but I'm guessing that you made them one at a time. Is that right, or you were doing them in parallel? That's a great question. We were doing them in parallel, but we had three different facilitators. Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Was it one facilitator for the first? Yes. Okay. Yes. So essentially, you know, if you look at this room, we kind of put people in the corners, mm -hmm. right? Because you wanted to kind of um, help to avoid distraction from the Absolutely. conversation. Okay. So we tried to put them far enough away. So even though they were in parallel, you tried to separate them Correct. As, as they were separate. Correct. Got it. Correct. Okay. And um, in terms of capturing the input, uh, were you relying on notes mostly or were you using some tools for like recording the screens or anything like that? That's a and great analyze question. analyze later. That's a great question. So on this project, we took notes. Mm -hmm. Again, budget, time, we were trying to get through this quickly. Um, we were actually advised to um, use automated uh, recording tools. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have the time to kind of put that together and set it up. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, I have used recording tools. Um, it is good, but it is time consuming to go back to analyze all of that data. Because now you're essentially reviewing a video all over again. So if you are able to take notes and you can write down your key information, you remember that, it's easier to kind of um, digest the information that you find. Yes? Um, performance in um, like how fast the page loads, that kind of. Yeah. We were not testing that necessarily with user testing. Okay. Um, our developers did do performance testing and I believe they have some scripts to kind of test. Mm -hmm. um, this was really focused on user interaction um, and making sure the user can get to the information um, that they were looking for easily. Do you know about how much time uh, you spent prepping for the test, like setting up the hotspots and vision, and um, you know, which questions you're using? Did you have a handful of meetings to make sure those were the right questions, or based on past research, somebody just came up with the questions and sure. that's what you use? So that's a great question. Um, we came up with the, the test questions. Um, we had a series of meetings, and I don't have the numbers all on the top of my head, but I'll say maybe. Um, you know, it was several months to arrive at the prototype part because we did our information analysis. So remember I said we tested to begin with, so that took a couple of weeks. Um, you know, we did a, re, um, a card sorting exercise to come up with a new information architecture that was our assumption that we were going to test with. Um, it took a couple of weeks to kind of identify what the best um, test questions for each persona. Um, so it was, it was a, a couple of months before we were actually at the point where we could test, test the users. 
probably you were thinking about that while Absolutely. creating the user personas, working on the tasks. Absolutely. Basically, tasks will drive the questions later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes? So you've mentioned uh, throughout that you know, keeping the uh, test group small is really important. Um, you, and you had three sort of general groups you mentioned, right? Uh, faculty, students, what was the other one? Department managers. Department managers. So if, you're, if your website is handling, you know, say eight distinct user groups, how do you keep, how would you just like one from each would be your advice? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. So we actually, I just mentioned three, but we actually have more than three. Right. So let me jump back to uh, my list. Are we close to time? Okay. Um, so I mentioned that. 12 minutes. 12 minutes, thank you. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that we tested our list of primary users. We tried to get one person from each of these groups. Correct. So then something happened and you're like, we really didn't need one user from each. Right. So, um, for example, you know, the librarian and the department chair and the department manager, they all kind of found the same issue. So um, how did you whittle that down? How did you find, like, how did you come to whittle that down to five or so users? Um, meaning as my test Right, if you went back for your second prototype, you said you got down to like five or something. Great question. We just looked to see who was available to test. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, that might not be the, you know, the scientific way of doing it, but... You still wanted to hit some specific groups, right? You didn't right. want them all to come from one. Correct. I mean, we tried to. We tried to get a cross-section, but second time around, that wasn't necessarily possible. Um, we just look for people who were available, which is why we wound up with some repeat testers and some new testers. So all of the people from our first group, they may not have been available, or they were like, okay, I helped you one time, don't keep coming to the well, you know? So um, you just find who's available. Um, and again, you're just retesting your assumptions and your changes, and, and you'll find the, the answer you're looking for. And it will probably depend on the tasks, right? Basically, if the different types of users have the same task, they will find the same issue. True. And in the bigger scheme of things, this is a relatively easy test, right? You're asking them to, to navigate. When you get web applications, when you're clicking through and you have to log in and you have to do some complicated activity, that's a very type of focused test. Um, then you want to kind of revisit who you're testing. But in this case, it was relatively simple. Um, we kind of knew what we were looking for, where we were headed. We just wanted to confirm that. Sure. Did you ever have uh, considered like sending out your questions before you could sort of work their way through it now? You don't want to prep them. Right. You want them to see this with fresh eyes. Um, and what we saw were some people who were very, so familiar with the old site that when we did our initial tests and we asked them to find things, they navigated to it quickly because they've been using it for 10 years. And they knew exactly where to go and how to get there. But then when we asked them to look at the new design and find that same document that they could find in a split second, they had to think a little bit. So that's when they're starting to think through, you know, what am I trying to do? And how do I get there? So, no, you do not want to prepare the user in advance. Yes? Did you ever ask the users, what are you, what would you look for on the site, or what would you need to do your job that you would find here so that, you know, that's what they want? Yes, great question. We did that as part of our, um, developing our user personas. We talk through and try to identify what is it that this type of person, person is trying to do on the website. Um, we also got some of that information from our first test on the old site, right? So we look to see department manager, what is important to you? What are you looking for? So that's how we kind of frame the questions for the new site. 
Um, and like this gentleman said, that through all of our working sessions and our thought processes, we always had this in the back of our mind, right? So this type of person is looking for X. When we go to frame uh, to develop our questions, we're going to develop it very specifically for this user. Another question? Have you done any virtual testing versus the in-person bringing them in? Like if you've had any international students using test or... Oh, that's a good question. Uh, done, like a screen share to do that? So international students, no. <laughs> I've never tested, um, you know, overseas. Um, not on this project, but in past projects, I've used usertesting.com. Um, and that actually is a great tool because, um, you know, you don't know the user, you don't know the person actually testing, but they're going to try to find someone that fits your criteria. So, for example, you give them a list of demographics. I'm looking for a female who's between 25 and 35 um, with this type of, you know, criteria and they'll find people that fall into that category to test for you. Um, and it was very similar to this gentleman where they recorded themselves so you can hear them, their voice and their thought process, but then you can also see where their mouse is moving, what they're clicking on, and they're talking through um, what they're doing. Um, and that, it was very useful. But to my point earlier, it took a long time to go back and kind of re-watch uh, those videos. Um, Usertesting.com provides a transcript of every test session, which was helpful, because when we got uh, like so brain dead of watching these videos, you can kind of scan quickly through the, um, the transcripts. But again, it's very, very time consuming. Yes. Um, it's not free. Um, I don't remember the uh, price off the top of my head, but it was like a pricing structure. Mm -hmm. For example, um, you can purchase five test licenses, or you can purchase twenty-five tests. Mm -hmm. It was something like that. But you can go on the website, and I'm sure they had this the testing schedule uh, pricing structure there. Any other questions? Okay, I mean, that's uh, essentially the end of the presentation. And we got through all of the questions. <laughs>